Yourselves are, are yourselves are honored. Yes, uh, we would ask if you're visiting with us, we would that you would uh, take a card in the pew in front of you and fill it out so that we'd have a record of your visit, and so that we might can uh, welcome uh, send you a thank you note for worshiping here with us. With that being said, let us have a quick word of prayer before as we continue in our worship. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all the many blessings you bestow upon us. We pray, Father, that we would not take for granted all of these blessings. We pray, Father, that we'd be sober-minded and realize all that you have done and continue to do for us. Be with us here, Father, as we offer this worship up to thee. May it be a sweet-smelling savor to you, and may we be blessed by being here. Once again, Father, we ask you to forgive us when we fall short. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the church is one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord she
Good morning. morning. Scripture reading today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me. blessing to be here with you this morning. I've, I've reached the stage of my life where my memory grows weak. I was uh, fortunate enough to remember though that last week on Thursday was our 54th wedding anniversary. It was a uh, snowy day in Abilene, Texas when uh, I married the love of my life. Unfortunately, uh, I forgot to bring in the tender plants last night and it may be the last anniversary that we celebrate. <laughs> Let's focus on Jesus. We typically at this time focus on what Jesus has done. This morning, let's share that focus with what Jesus is doing. What He's still doing for us on an ongoing basis. Start by reading from the seventh chapter of Hebrews. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able, once and forever, to save those who come to God through Him. Now give special attention to this next sentence. He lives forever. 
to intercede with God on their behalf. The there there is us, even today. Now from the 8th chapter of Romans. Who will then con condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us. And He's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. There was an old Scottish preacher who once said, if I could hear Jesus in the next room praying for me, I would not be afraid of one million of the enemies. Yet, distance has no meaning. Jesus is praying for us. For the Christian, the prayerful intercession of Christ means everything. Since the advocacy his advocacy, advocacy is the safeguard of the church. Let's pray. Father, we realize that our salvation is, is due to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. His resurrection. And His ongoing intercession on our behalf. We praise and adore Him and thank You for Him, Father. And it's in His name that we lift up these words. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, we know there's no limit to the degree or the duration of 
our salvation. But we, we also understand that salvation only comes through Jesus from you. Father, we now, we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. pray for our offering. Father, we thank you for all the many ways that you bless us. We are truly blessed to, to live in this country and to live in this beautiful village. Father, we pray your continued blessings on us and on your church at this place. Father, we pray now that you would bless this offering that we make to you and Father, we ask a special blessing on those who will see to its use. In Jesus' name, amen.
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Assemble ourselves before the throne of God. Holy Father, creator of heaven and earth, as your children, we agree with the words of the song, 10,000 Reasons, and we bless you, Lord, and worship your holy name. There are more than 10,000 reasons that we are thankful today, and above all is Jesus, who is living death and rising we just celebrated we know our lives would be empty without him and we don't know where to begin to say thanks except presenting ourselves a living sacrifice to you in our church family right now there are those who are hurting in so many ways we cry out for your healing power and give you praise Place upon the hearts of everyone here and those who are watching at home your forgiveness, hope, and the peace that passes all understanding. We stand against Satan today and every day and realize his power, but we know the price your son paid already won the war on the cross. We ask for your touch on our leadership, the elders, deacons, Joe, Ray Don, Alan, those who minister through song and those who teach at every level. Thank you, God, as well, for the women in this church family. They minister in precious and meaningful ways. We close this prayer in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus. If you would please, though, keep your eyes closed and head bowed for just another moment. As we sing together a song you already know, you don't need the book, you don't need the screen. But please join me in singing together, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good, He's so good to me. And together let the church say,
Children, go where I send you. Send you this way. Uh, wrong song. We'll do a different one as they go. <clears throat> Friend of peace, did it again. I'm glad I didn't do a solo. I was going to stand, but when no one else did, I said, no, I'm not going to go there. All right. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, welcome to each and every one of you this morning, and uh, we uh, we have it this morning, finally. I don't know why we never did this before, but uh, for the ladies who are working with the uh, luncheon this morning, and we're so thankful for all those who minister to us, Bob was right. We have so many that minister, not just in that way, but in so many other ways in this church family. But those who are doing so next door uh, can can at least catch an ear to what's going on now in here uh, this morning. So with the uh, uh, via the live stream. So to those to those who are um, joining us in other places via the live stream, we welcome you uh, in our assembly as well. Um, Every Thursday during Young Life Summer Camp in Colorado, that's an evangelistic type of ministry to teens, Young Life is, 400 students would make their way up the 14,000 foot climb up Mount Chrysolite. Several Young Life leaders and the one telling this story walked with them. On one particular Thursday, somewhere around the 4,000 foot mark, a student named Matt decided to call it quits. And here's where Max Ocato tells the rest of his story. He says, I coaxed him, I begged him, finally negotiated a plan with him. 30 steps for 60 seconds of resting. And finally we stood with a thousand feet left of the peak. But the last stretch of the trail rose up straight as a fireman's ladder. We got serious. Two guys came up beside Matt, each taking an arm, and I pushed him from the rear. We all but dragged Matt past the timber line and the awesome, uh, to the awesome view at the top. That's when we heard it. 400 campers on the crest of the mountain gave Matt a standing ovation. As I slumped down to rest, a thought came to me. There it is, Max, a perfect picture of my plan. Do all you can to push each other to the top. Was this a message from God? Well, it did sound like something he'd say. That was taken from a long time ago, a, an article in a, a ministry journal. I like the story except for one thing. I'm not a climber uh, by any means, so I'm going to change the analogy to say this. We're all in Christ on a journey on our way home to the Lord. We can agree to that, right? And it's God's desire that we do everything possible to make sure that we help each other make our way home together. That's our, that's our mutual obligation, our mutual job. And that includes not putting hindrances in each other's way as we go. The journey's hard enough, 
sometimes that we don't need to make it even harder uh, on each other. But as Acts 15 opens, and if you want to turn, that'll be the text this morning, that's exactly what we see happening in Acts 15. Some Jewish Christians were about to put a major stumbling block in the road, which if unchecked could become a hindrance to all of them making it through to reach home together. So this chapter is largely consumed with this little conference in Jerusalem uh, with the elders and the apostles. And it was truly a big deal in regards to the implications for the church moving forward if this didn't get settled correctly, the issue that comes up in Acts 15. Instead of just reading it, I want to tell you the story. And uh, you can read along with me if you wish, and then we'll talk about the implications for us. Because while the issue going on in that text is not one that troubles us today, it is very symbolic of things that we can and still do to put, uh, put hindrances in each other's way today. So the backdrop to the story is this. God had opened the door of salvation to non-Jews several years earlier in the ministry of Peter to Cornelius. You remember that story in Acts 10. And so as chapter 15 opens, Luke has been telling us that more and more Gentiles are responding to the good news of Jesus, accepting God's offer of grace through faith salvation. And it's about to be the point at which the Gentile converts are starting to outnumber the uh, Jewish uh, Christians, who obviously were the first ones to hear the word uh, of, of God. And I can see how it would make the Jews, who are very morally conscious of so many things already, as opposed to many Gentile converts in that part of the world that they were not conscious of before their conversion, I can see that how this would make the Jews very uncomfortable that were in the church. With that in mind, some of these Jews, who Paul will later label in his Galatians letter, Judaizers, said in one of the church assemblies in Antioch in Syria one day that they had decided it was necessary for new Gentile converts to be circumcised in order for them to be Christians. Or to put it another way, we think it's best that they become Jews to be good Christians. Now Paul and Barnabas, fresh off their first missionary journey, primarily converting, guess who, Gentiles, they said, no way. But we will defer on this issue to the elders and the apostles at the church in Jerusalem. And so the Jerusalem conference, as we call it, was born. What was really the issue here? Uh, I'm not sure that we can really, in our setting, get a handle on how big a deal this was that had now arisen in the church. But here you had folks casting aspersions on the all-sufficiency of Jesus' word and his will and salvation, as if what he had told his men and that they had passed on to others was not enough to be fully in the Lord. These Judaizers wanted to say, well, salvation is really a matter of Jesus plus. Jesus plus, just to be safe and, and to please us, in parentheses, some leading tenets of Judaism thrown in for good measure. That's what we think it ought to take for those who are coming in from outside to be saved. You see, what these folks were advocating for was a change in the Word of God, changing the truth of the Gospel, saying that it's not just about what Jesus came to die for, it's something else. It's saying that personal preferences and comfort zones and, that, and all the other can be elevated above the simple gospel. We spoke of it last week. It's pretty simple. The core of the gospel is about the fact that Jesus died and was buried and was raised to new life so that we can put away our old lives in reaching for His forgiveness and one can, by the same power by which He was raised to life, we can be able to live new lives that He calls us to now live in Him. Remember the genius of the Gospel. The good news of Jesus was that it was all about God's free, unmerited, all-sufficient grace by which we can now be saved. Rather than trying to work our way 
into salvation by works of flesh or somehow earn it or merit it as if we ever could. Christianity was not an add-on to anything. Like Judaism, nor did it need to be supplemented by anything else as if it were somehow inadequate. So I think it's safe to say for as Paul and Barnabas' parts, they were pretty confident about how the leaders of the first church, the mother church, if you will, at Jerusalem, how they were going to respond to this, what they were going to say, but yet they were going to take this issue to them and have them discuss it. But for their part, they were not willing to compromise the truth and simplicity of the gospel. But there was a second big issue at stake. One was the gospel. The other was regarding destroying the unity of the Spirit. We just heard from the reading a moment ago from Paul's words to the Ephesians. This was another huge concern. Unity of the Spirit being kept in the bond of peace. What do you think would have happened? if it got around that the leaders of this Christian movement said, well, instead of an entirely new thing, we've decided we're just going to be an offshoot of Judaism. Kind of another sect of Judaism, which, by the way, is what the Roman Empire, that's how the Roman Empire viewed Christianity even for a number of years to come. From its inception, they thought, well, it's just, it's just a part of Judaism. It's another, another new thing that comes from Judaism. It's kind of an add-on. What do you think would happen if that got around, if that became the new word? The church would be fractured. The unity of spirit that Paul would tell Ephesians in chapter 4 that's our obligation to maintain would be lost. Talk about putting a stumbling block to any other non-Jew who might even think they were considering becoming a Christian. I'd say, if I saw that and I was in that position, I'd say, no way. I don't want any part of that. Paul made very clear that Jesus' death, in Jesus' death, the walls came down that had made the separation between Jew and Gentile in Ephesians 2, 14-16. God's design was always that the gospel would be for all, and that all would be able to be one in Christ Jesus. The unity of the Spirit means He's the one who made it, and He's made us obligated to keep it. Do we get that? It's not our unity. He's the one who made it. But He calls on us to keep it, to preserve it. So we're responsible for that. And so for those reasons, the keeping of the unity and to keep the integrity of the gospel, Paul and Barnabas were sent to Jerusalem to the conference. As they went, they continued to testify as to the very reason, that is what God had done among Gentiles, they continued to testify why, why exactly why what the Judaizers had asked for was wrong. And so they come to Jerusalem. And they're welcomed by the elders and apostles. They tell all the exciting news of how God is breaking down walls right and left as Gentiles are entering the kingdom. And as the church is celebrating this fact, guess what happens? In come some converted Pharisees, of which, by the way, Paul was one. But these converted Pharisees stood up and said exactly what the Judaizers at Antioch had said. We think the Gentile converts ought to be circumcised and made to obey the law of Moses. Talk about throwing ice cold water on all the exciting news of what God was doing in the kingdom. That would do it. Or putting a blanket over a fire, however you want to say that. And so the elders and apostles got in a breakout session, if you will executive session, I guess. And they hash all this out. And Peter stands up. And we begin to hear the arguments. 
of this issue. Peter stands up in that session. He basically preaches a three-point sermon. So you see, those came long ago. That's not a new thing. Um, he says, look, I want you to remember how God used me to open the door of the kingdom to the Gentiles in the person of Cornelius. We don't give God sufficient credit. You, you remember what happened, how the door was opened? It wasn't just any individual. God chose one of the most important individuals in the kingdom, in the Roman kingdom in that time. A Roman centurion. Think of the doors that started to open and walls that started to come down because of that one God chose to be the first. But he said, you remember how this started. And the Spirit confirmed that this was what God wanted because He came into them just as He had us Jews without any distinction. In the second place, Consider this, how in the world, when the Gentiles who've never had any background in the law whatsoever, how in the world can we make them accountable to it when in all our long history with it, we couldn't do it? How do you expect them to keep it when we weren't doing it? We can't put a burden like that on non-Jews. And then third, in his big finish, he says, if we were to allow this new thing to be required, what we're saying is that the grace of God is not sufficient. And the truth of the matter is, the Gentiles were saved with nothing more and nothing less than God's saving grace, just like us. So Paul and Barnabas chimed in with the word of all the signs and wonders God did among them, among the Gentiles who were coming to Jesus during their mission. As if to add to Peter's word, why would we put, why would we put a stumbling block like this in front of our new Gentile brothers and sisters? We can't do it. And finally, church leader James. This is a story in and of itself, right? Church leader James. I'm not talking about the brother of John, he was already, he'd already long been executed. He was out of the picture. I'm talking about James, the one so godly and sincere that he was called James the Just. With stories told of his knees being so tough, they were like a camel's knees from being down on them so often in prayer. The same James who was Jesus' brother and during Jesus' ministry, an unbeliever. This James gets up and says, Brothers, listen. Peter already said it very well. That it's been God's will all along for us to welcome the Gentiles into His kingdom. And the prophets even have confirmed it. So let's not put stumbling blocks in front of them. Let's put down the idea of having to be a good Jew in order to be a good Christian. And that may have been hard because he was a good Jew, remember. Let's put that away. Set that aside, the idea that the gospel is a matter of Jesus plus anything else. It's not. It's just about Jesus being Lord and letting Him be Lord of His church. Now, I will say he added, for conscience sake of Jewish brothers and sisters, several dietary concession, concessions that he suggested strongly the Gentiles take up, and along with, obviously, the larger issue, which all Christians must do, that is, abstain from sexual sins, you see, non-Christian Gentiles, uh, non Gentiles 
did not have the scruples against sexual sin as the Jews already did. That was already factored in to their life before Christ. And so they were to abstain from these things to get along with their Jewish brothers and sisters. The council's decision was confirmed, the letter drawn up, and Paul and Barnabas were elected to go back along with some others and take the word to Antioch. And God, through that council, secured a double victory that day. A victory of truth in confirming the gospel of grace and a victory in love in preserving the unity of the Spirit. It was a win-win. Okay. You have listened politely, and yet some of you I know have been thinking, I still don't get why Acts 15 matters to us. What difference does it make? We don't have to deal with anything, anyone being obligated to be circumcised or to live by the law of Moses. Here's the deal. And I've mentioned this before, so now I have to be brief with this part before closing. There have been many and various ways in which we, in the church, in our faith family specifically, that we have put stumbling blocks in people's way of either coming to Jesus or, if converted, staying with Jesus. We've gotten better with some of these, but in some places we still have a ways to go. I have known, for example, of some congregations to have told someone that even though they've been scripturally baptized into Christ after believing the gospel, that because it wasn't done in one of our church buildings, you've got to be baptized again. Folks, that is a terrible roadblock to put in the way of someone who's already in Christ. Now, if they are, <clears throat> if they are confused about it, if they're not sure, if they need someone to show them the way of Christ more <clears throat> more perfectly, that's one thing. But if they were convicted and sure in receiving Jesus and His grace in the biblical way, that should settle it. But in some cases, we've told people in the past that's not enough. I hope no groups are still doing that, but I suspect some are. Another one. And it's very ironic that I'm wearing this today. Um, th this is my celebratory. We're, we're about to have a festive celebration next door, okay? So this is my celebratory time. <clears throat> but I've said this one before as well. One reason that I don't wear a suit anymore when I'm typically up here is that I heard from one of my contemporaries of my age one time as to why she wasn't with us anymore. This individual and her son, I considered part of this church family at one time. I asked her why she wasn't with us anymore, and she said, I didn't feel like I fit in because everyone was so formal. And I just couldn't live up to that. I didn't have that kind of stuff. I I'm not able to do that. Now, this was a number of years ago, keep in mind. I've been here 18 years. I've seen a lot of people come and a lot of people go. Again, I'm thankful we're not as formal anymore. And I will admit that perhaps, because there were some other things, perhaps that was just one of the easiest things she grabbed as a, as a rationale, okay? But for some, it is a big deal. For the sake of Jesus, why would, we, why would we ever want to put a roadblock in someone's way that makes someone feel less than or that they don't fit? Here's the thing. If Jesus got selective, do you think anyone, any of us would be here? Some of you already know the answer to that. 
I already heard the answer with some of you. <laughs> Another one, and of course, we always bring this up when we think of modern day comparisons to Paul talking about meat sacrificed to idols. We always say it's the closest thing we can get. What if one of our good friends here in Salado, and a number of them are Christ believing folks, I know because I have a lot of friends like this in Salado, but what if one of our friends in Salado likes to drink socially? They don't get drunk. They can control themselves, but they like to social drink a lot. Sorry, I should I said that too loudly. But I, I do know some like that. Okay. What if what if one of those is converted to Christ? Can we legislate to them that now they can't touch a, a single drop? No. Nor should we. Again, that's putting another stumbling block and making another legislation and burden on someone for whom Jesus died just like He died for us. Now, I, I am not saying that they should flaunt the fact that they can handle that okay in front of weaker brothers or sisters who have a conscientious problem. We have some of those as well. We have some who have a struggle with this. Some who struggle with addiction. Out of love, if they're around those folks, don't do it. Don't, don't take part in that. If you have them over, don't leave your stuff out where they can see it. If you know it's going to be a problem. But to legislate where neither the Lord nor, by the way, the apostles ever did is forbidden. We can't do it. I could preach on and on about that one, but You've heard enough about that. And I know there, there are lots more of these, but that's sufficient, I think, for time's sake to make the point. We cannot put a hindrance to anyone coming into the kingdom that Jesus did not put up. Amen? Because when we do, the real problem now is we're not letting Jesus be Lord of His church. And God help us if we either change or distort the truth of the gospel or disrupt the unity of the body that we're charged with preserving without ever compromising or changing truth. We don't have to do either one. We don't have to break up unity. We don't have to compromise truth. But if we do, God's going to hold us responsible for doing that. Prince of Peace, control my will. That's what this is about. The kingdom is not about my wants or wishes, my personal preferences or hang-ups or anything else. It's about us letting Jesus reign in our lives and sharing what that means with others by planting the seed. And when they respond, it's about us getting out of the way and letting Him be their Lord too. We sang the first two verses, a Prince of Peace, Control My Will, to start this. We're going to finish it with Gaines leading us in the last two verses. Let's stand and sing together. May thy will not mine be done. May thy will.
I think we have them, well, I know we have them lined up this morning. Folks are going to say a few words, but I'm, I, I preempted them for just a moment um, for a word about one who is uh, near to many of us, known by most of us, and uh, she wants to make it known officially that she wants to be back with us. Am I on? Okay. Yes. Uh, that she wants to be back with us again, uh, regular fellowship and work and worship with our church family. Uh, she's sitting right here in the center section, our sister Billy Kennedy. I'll have her stand and be recognized, please, just for a moment. Thank you, Billy. If you knew the Kennedys before, she and Bob, uh, that was always a joke, but they introduced themselves as Billy Bob. Uh, back in the day when they first came. Uh, they uh, were here for a year or two with us in fellowship working with us and they went to the Tyler area or to Tyler, um, lived there for several years. Uh, Bob became uh, more and more ill uh, in his health, had a downturn. Um, we lost Bob um, just a couple months ago now and uh, since that time, well, let me back up. Billy was already in the process of, of moving back to this area. And she's kind of got the plans now, right, for the house that she's going to have built in Mill Creek. Right now she's out at our little uh, RV park uh, just north of town. Uh, so um, we are we're loving the fact that she's back with us and wanting to work and worship with us again. And so I hope you get, if you have not met her, there's always new ones coming in. New folks coming in, but if you haven't, I hope you meet her and get to know her. Uh, she's a wonderful Christian sister. Let me pray just a moment. Father, we are thankful for uh, welcoming uh, our sister Billy back with us uh, today. And uh, she's been back with us for a time now, and we're thankful for that. And may we continue to be an encouragement and help with her as she uh, continues to move forward in her uh, new life without Bob. Um, we continue to pray for her and uh, that you would strengthen her and, and continue to give her peace and continue to be present with her uh, in special ways as I know that you have. And uh, Father, we, we are prayerful for ways that she can help us as we all help each other to be more of who you want us and expect us to be as your people in this place. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next, whoever's next. <laughs> I'll be quick. I just want to give you an update on the milk fund drive we're having for the uh, babies at the orphanage in Namuyanga. We had our special offering last Sunday, and we connect, collected about $5,600. And so uh, we set this coming Sunday as sort of a cutoff date, not that you can't give after that. In fact, you can give any time that you want, but just make sure that if you, if you do make an offering at this point that you write on the check that is for milk fund. There's actually a category in on, on the online giving page that for Milk Fund, so you can check that there. Just let the person you give it to know. Uh, I didn't want to wait too long because the church in Colorado Springs that collects the supplies and ships those is actually because of supply shortages and, and labor shortages. They had to, to make a drive across country to Tennessee to get supplies and also collect formula on the, formula on the way because they were never going to be able to get enough there locally in time so they're kind of out a lot of money in order to make those purchases we need to reimburse them as fast as we can so if you have any questions just let me know thanks i'll beat you to it sorry uh, i did want to uh, have charles announce this but i didn't get it to him in time uh, the ladies advent class will take place again this evening at six o'clock uh, but since Mary is still not back to normal, um, Nyla Sparks has graciously volunteered to host that class tonight. Uh, and so, so many of you have asked about Mary. Uh, she said she's feeling just a little bit better this morning. So thank you so much for all those prayers and please continue to keep those going. And, and thank you, Nyla, for hosting that. Six o'clock this evening, ladies' Advent class at Nyla's house. And then also I told y'all today I would give the Christmas stroll thank yous. Uh, just very quick. Again, Joey Dizernowski uh, built our fire pit. And if you haven't seen that, go look at it. I think that was a, a big part of, of why people loved it so much. 
Thank you to Gaines and Mary Smith for providing all of our firewood, installing those beautiful lights, and making the washers pits. Appreciate all, the, all of your work. To James Chavers for the portable lights and the extension cords, those came in handy once again. To Ed Sestala, calling him the keeper of the flame. Where is he? There he is. I think he really enjoyed himself, and he did a great job with our fire. And then the Baileys, the Dizernowskis, the Watsons, the Melchings, the Keys, the Lions, the McIntoshes, and Sally Gray and Ann Lachlan for helping serve folks who stopped by, and I hope I got all of those. And thank you to all of you who donated funds and s'more supplies. Uh, this was a a total group church effort, uh, and, and I appreciate it so much. If I never see a s'more packet again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> because by my best efforts of guessing, I told you all last weekend we served over 700 folks last Friday and Saturday night, and then last night and Friday night we served over 800 by my best guest efforts. So I think this was a huge, again, church group effort, and I feel it was extremely successful, and I pray a very fruitful event. Thank you. I want to ask uh, the other shepherds to come forward, and you can stand or sit right here. And uh, we have a special presentation we'd like to make. A couple of them that just take a very short time. And uh, could, could be a long time because they're waiting on James back there. <laughs> He's coming. <laughs> so I'm going to swap out with Billy here and let Billy make the uh, presentation. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I'm going to invite Charles Allen to join us here, if he will. Charles, would you please? Charles Allen retired from his employment here with the church uh, at the first of this year. First of this year, almost a year ago. He'd probably served the church here over 40 years. Uh, in various things that he did here as, as he was a member here and volunteered for a lot of things. He wound up being employed here, though, as our facilities manager and responsible for a lot of things here at the building. The building he was in charge of, uh, from the custodial work to the routine repairs to opening and closing the doors to straightening up the chairs and the tables, all those kinds of things. He did these things for approximately 12 years. When he retired the first of the year, uh, he drifted off not knowing what to do much, but he had other things he needed to do. Among other things, he, he is an artist. Uh, he enjoys those kinds of things. And indeed, the evidence of, of, of some of his work you see here on the wall behind me in the, in the, in the uh, cross that's on this wall, and there's a cross on the wall over in the uh, AC. If you'll take note of that as you go in the door. Uh, Charles has been with us a while, but he served us well as the facilities manager, and it's for that this morning that we want to particularly uh, recognize him. And I'd like to read this, uh, read this plaque uh, presented to Charles Allen in recognition of devoted service to the Salado Church family for over 40 years, especially as facilities manager from 2009 through 2020. With sincere love and appreciation, Salado Church of Christ. Charles, it's my privilege to present to you this plaque as of the elders of the church here. Thank you. I serve in any way that we could, in any way that I could, and I've enjoyed it. It's a great family to be here and be a part of. I'm very thankful for it.
we have another plaque, an award to make uh, this morning, and that's with uh, the retirement of our brother, James Haney. James, as you know, has had a, a career, 50 years plus, of serving ch the Church of Our Lord. Here in Salado, he came back here after retiring from the active and full-time pulpit ministry, uh, I believe in 2005. Uh, he spent a lot of years in Moody, and from there he retired and moved back here. A short time later, he was named the office manager for the church here and began keeping, keeping things straight in the office. Uh, record keeper was an understatement. He kept records of everything. He served us well. He was appointed as an elder, and he yet serves as an elder here. But the first of this year, as did Charles uh, uh, before him, uh, he retired from that employment here. And because of the pandemic, perhaps, because of the, the uh, uncertainties from time to time throughout the year, when things could be, be done, and uh, no excuses particularly, but uh, I think it was Paul that said, uh, show honor to whom honor is due. Uh, this is a situation of being honor being overdue. Uh, and hopefully he will forgive us for this, but we wanted yet to recognize him for his service here as the office manager of, of our church, serving us in lots of ways, but indeed uh, retiring from that employment uh, the first of this year. James, it's my privilege again to present to you the plaque in behalf of the elder and the church family. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. This was unexpected, but I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. It, I still miss it, the work that I did, but I appreciate this so much. I guess I say I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. May I just add one word? Uh, along with Charles and along with James, uh, uh, they're good wives. Uh, uh, Lynn, in James's interest, uh, Lynn has carried the, the, the load of that partner, as has Suzanne for Charles, as long as he served here. We appreciate your service as well. I'll finish up just by uh, reminding everybody of our meal across the street, and uh, please uh, don't run off. Please join us. Dear God, our Father, we so much uh, thank you for the blessings that we have gotten so used to, uh, but we ask, Father, your uh, uh, continued blessings on us as a family, and help us to grow ever stronger uh, in the unity that... Uh, uh, Joe spoke about today, and uh, we pray that uh, we'll show Christ in our own lives uh, that will be seen by others, and that we'll bring more people to Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is there anyone else? <laughs> Would you please stand? In the Bible it says, after one of the early reports of the Lord's Supper said, and they sang a hymn, after they had sang a hymn, they departed that place. <laughs> Troubles and times and times are near, millions for men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all dear, now is at stake, now is at stake. Humble in your hearts to God, say so much, 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 say so much,
Eagles are bound, eagles are bound. When the signs when the signs come to pass, hearing the young man pass, they will come very fast. Trumpets will sound. Jesus is Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night or noon, many will many will.